Sure. All right. Um, so today I'm going to give you a talk in three parts. Uh, first, I want to give you this introduction to the star formation law and laws used here in air quotes, especially here at CETA where laws mean things. Um, this is, uh, I'll go into the history a bit about the star formation law. Then I'm going to talk about two separate projects that are driven by surveys in the field. Uh, first, I'll talk about the application of some machine learning techniques in the Extra Galactic Database for Galaxy Evolution, or EDGE. And then I'll talk about the physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies survey to give you a sense of what the next generation of observations are going to look like. Now, every one of my talks, I like to start off with this particular image because everything that I study in astrophysics has to do with part of the baryon cycle in uh, the galaxies. Where we think, I think about the stellar generations as connecting through the ISM, through these different stages that we know from stellar evolution and galaxy evolution, where stars, uh, high mass, stars will lose a lot of baryons out into the ISM, which will then cool and collect into the next generation of stars. In the context of galaxy evolution, this is nowhere near a closed system. We have inflow from the IGM feeding material in and building up galaxies. We lose material back to the IGM through galactic winds and feedback. And then, of course, we also lock up material into long-lived uh, stars and stellar remnants. And that kind of disappears from the cycle overall. But for the purposes here today, I want to focus on the efficiency with which we connect the ISM into stars uh, as we go kind of gas to stars in galaxies and ask the question, what regulates the efficiency of that process and how does that vary across the local universe? As an observer, I should set the stage to say that everything that we do is going to be dictated by the requirement to trace molecular gas at 10 Kelvin. And of course, at 10 Kelvin, most of the material in the ISM is going to be invisible. And so we have to rely on tracer species, and I'll be leveraging two tracers, uh, but mostly the rotational emission lines from carbon monoxide, which is about a part in 200 of the mass in the ISM. And then 1% uh, of the mass is acting in, uh, is locked up in dust grains as well, which acts to reprocess the radiation field in galaxies. Uh, the rotational transitions, just to remind you of the observational shorthand here, uh, we rely on the principal rotational or the rotational quantum numbers of CO's rotational transitions. And so I'll be referring a lot to CO 1 to 0 or 2 to 1, which are these millimeter wave transitions at the ground states of the rotational ladder and the carbon monoxide molecule. And because the characteristic energies of those transitions are well matched to about 10 Kelvin temperatures, of the gas, this acts as an effective coolant of the molecular medium. And so that really drags the temperatures down to this characteristic 10 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin temperature in galaxies. So I'll be discussing these rotational transitions a fair bit. I'll also occasionally invoke thermal dust emission, which is reprocessing the optical and ultraviolet radiation in galaxies into, short, into long wavelength radiation. Uh, this figure here shows a couple of SEDs as a function of frequency and brightness here on the vertical axis at uh, three different dust temperature uh, models. And uh, the bands here are kind of characteristic observational bands that we use a lot uh, to map out the interstellar medium. In particular, this is giving us a sense of the total column density of material uh, along any given line of sight. So we like the dust continuum because it allows us to do very wide area surveys effectively. And one of those uh, surveys we can apply is to use Herschel imaging uh, of this is dust continuum from a nearby molecular cloud. Uh, so this is the hosts of star formation. It's about 200 parsecs away. So this is solar neighborhood uh, star formation. And there the angular resolution of the Herschel Space Telescope is going to match well enough to the actual act of individual stars forming. So we can look at the dark regions in this map. Those correspond to high column density features in the interstellar medium. And that is where we see these stars forming. In fact, 
some of these features here are actually individual stellar systems that are forming. When we use the loosely defined observational term of cores to refer to the uh, gas structures that are going to go on and form an individual stellar system. This is just to remind you of these are what the host structures of star formation actually look like, but I prefer to take this image and turn the stretch down a fair bit so we can get way down into the low column density weeds and see this. And what I want you to sort of take away from this image is that it's a mess. There's tons of physics that's going on, and star formation is happening at this intersection of turbulence and the magnetic uh, fields and gravitation and kinetic energies are all in rough equipartition so that all of the star formation processes that are emerging come out of this train wreck of physics somehow. And this is kind of the best local scale observations that we can make of the star formation process. But that is separated by orders of magnitude from the scales at which we're going to be thinking about today, where we back out to kind of kiloparsec scales in galaxies and look at the carbon monoxide emission here across this galaxy. This is the M51 galaxy, uh, kind of a classic spiral. CO emission shown here in blue. And we're backing all the way out to very large scales. And we want to understand how the galaxies here are actually regulating their internal star formation processes. And when we take a look at this, we can see the imprint of galaxy uh, dynamics on the star formation process, where we can map out the spiral arms in this galaxy, kind of the easiest galaxy to do this in. And we can watch material flow from the atomic and ionized media into the molecular clouds. And then downstream uh, in the spiral arm, we see new clusters and H2 regions emerging here. But I call this in contrast with how I started the talk to remind you that Every one of these little blips here that we're looking at has this huge wealth of physical substructure within this. And we're treating star formation as a subgrid process. And we're trying to figure out how do we relate the global properties of galaxies down to the train wreck of physics that is happening at these smaller scales. And so we're interested in like, what's actually happening here and connecting that back up to the largest scales. To do that, we follow the observational path of writing down and exploring this idea of the star formation law. And so at this, I'm going to take kind of a historical perspective and march through how we've developed this idea to tackle this complicated physics at small scales over all of the galaxies at large scales. And the first kind of approach to this that received a lot of traction in the literature was this 1959 paper by Schmidt, who conjectured that the star formation rate density was going to scale like the volume density of gas to the 1.5 power. It's a relatively simple argument. You get one power of density by virtue of more is more. And then you get another half a power of density from the free fall time. And it's essentially saying the mass of gas in a system is going to form stars on a characteristic time scale of its free fall time. So if you take the density, divide by the free fall time, you get out this 1.5 power. But the volume density, clearly the physical property that'll uh, that we care about, but it is not observationally tractable in extragalactic systems. As a result, we think about the surface density of star formation. So this is star formation, stars formed per unit area per unit time as the surface density of star formation rate. And that's uh, we can explore empirically in terms of the surface density of gas. And so this is a classic star formation law uh, representation where we look at the surface density of star formation as a function of the surface density of gas on the horizontal axis. And we plot a bunch of galaxies here. And we get this, uh, or Rob Kennicutt and collaborators have laid out an empirical relationship here that says that the surface density of star formation scales like the gas to the 1.4 power. It's probably something you've seen before, but I want to call your attention to a couple features of this measurement. First, 
the gas, the horizontal axis here, is entirely neutral gas, is both the atomic phase of the interstellar medium and the molecular phase of the interstellar medium. The other thing is that this is entire galaxies. These are averages over the entire disks of galaxies. And so while it looks like it's a fairly resolved measurement, this is really averaged over 10 kiloparsec or larger scales, uh, representing the entire disks in these systems. But doesn't make a ton of sense to approach it this way because atomic gas is not linked with star formation in the observations that we make in the Milky Way. Stars form in molecular clouds. Thus, you want to turn your attention to what is the molecular gas doing separate from what the atomic gas is doing. And this was the next step in the iteration, in the evolution of our observations. We started looking at resolved maps of the molecular gas and the star formation rate tracers. So here's molecular gas on the left. That's a CO integrated intensity image made with the BIM a millimeter interferometer. On the right, you have a H alpha image, which is tracing the current star formation rate here. And these are both well resolved maps within, galaxy, uh, within a galaxy. So you take a galaxy and you resolve it to regions within it. And you need interferometers to do this. This, was, this is a story that is dictated by observational technology. Um, Kennecott's work was done with single dish telescopes and used optical imaging to set the disk areas. Here we can finally see what CO looks like on these smaller scales and map this out on a galaxy by galaxy case. These are uh, feathered already with 12 meter mapping as well. The, so these are fully recovered uh, data sets here. Um, we also can carry out the same observations here with the uh, atomic gas, uh, not feathered uh, with single dish data. So the interferometer data here from the VLA allows us to resolve where the atomic gas is. And we see, not surprisingly, that on small scales, Atomic gas has little to do with star formation. And so the next generation of star formation law papers began to look within galaxies on kiloparsec scales and found that, consistent with all this, the star formation rate for surface density within these regions scales like the molecular gas surface density to the 1.0 power. Uh, and that's largely a more is more kind of theoretical approach, more gas. More star formation. Uh, not terribly physically exciting at that point. Um, in terms of the literature, and just to give you an observational handle or a handle to hang your uh, mind on, we often express this in terms of a depletion time, which is the surface density of molecular gas divided by the surface density of the star formation. And we find that has a constant value because these two are proportional to each other. So it's essentially the um, the constant of proportionality between these two quantities. And so you can see that where they all line up with these diagonal dashed lines in this plot of surface density of star formation versus molecular gas surface density. Well, this was carried out in annular averages to bring up the signal to noise. And the next generation of observations was able to really get well-mapped carbon monoxide emission across the face of galaxies using, uh, uh, using a, uh, multi-pixel receivers on big single-dish telescopes. And that allowed us to combine the carbon monoxide emission, CO2 to 1 mapping, with the atomic gas mapping uh, in galaxies and build up a vision of what the total gas in the systems look like. Similarly, we could also use wideband star formation rate tracers like the far ultraviolet and the short wavelength infrared to bootstrap up what the star formation rate was looking like inside the galaxies. And if you compare these maps, you can sort of visually see that that the star formation seems to have more to do with the molecular gas than the atomic gas. But we're going to start to analyze this on individual kiloparsec scale regions within galaxies, sort of one of these little annula or one of these little lines of sight through here. And we can really start to dice this up in terms of what's happening in a galaxy at that point. It didn't evolve our uh, understanding too much. 
it did give us a better statistical basis for kind of making some of the statements that we're making. But again, if I plot the surface density of star formation rate versus the molecular gas surface density on kiloparsec scales, and we treat each line of sight as an individual sample in the space, we find a linear relationship between these two quantities. Again, uh, the red points here are the, uh, the typical values within uh, bins of constant uh, molecular gas surface density. And so phrasing the question that way statistically gives us a star formation rate that's uh, proportional to uh, the molecular gas to the 1.0 power. And we see this constant two gig year depletion time throughout the galactic sample. But for purposes of this talk, there's a real scatter in that relationship. 0.3 dex, so factor of two scatter, and that's in excess of the observational uncertainties. There's galaxy to galaxy variation in the star formation law, and we want to try to understand that. So that sets the next stage here, because galactic environment must matter. And so work that I wasn't involved in um, comes in and informs us that, well, we have to pay attention to the systems in which the star formation is happening. Um, the groundwork for this was laid in Sloan, which established, uh, and uh, similar surveys uh, through the early 2000s, which established that there were these two population of galaxies. Uh, and we parameterized that in terms of the specific star formation rate of these galaxies as a function of stellar mass. And uh, we see a segregation between these characteristic star forming galaxies in the sort of top part of this diagram and the non star forming galaxies down here at the bottom. Now, specific star formation is kind of an odd parameter. It takes me, as a gas person, it takes me a while to wrap my head around. But it's the global star formation rate of a galaxy uh, divided by the stellar uh, mass of the galaxy. And so while the depletion time is the time it takes to get rid of your molecular gas, the specific star formation rate is the inverse of the galaxy build time. That's how long it takes to assemble the galaxy at its current star formation rate. So we have these two characteristic time scales, and they're core or anti-correlated. Um, and that emerged from work that Emile Santange led using the IRM 30 meter telescope, who and they looked their collaboration looked at a bunch of different galaxies and compared their specific star formation rate and their depletion time again on these 10 kiloparsec scales and found this anti-correlation such that these quench systems uh, over here in the low uh, specific star formation rate corner had very high depletion times. And that's interesting. That's showing us that gas that's sitting inside these quench systems is solar mass by solar mass less efficient at forming stars than stuff that's up here in these actively star forming galaxies. Why? What is it about those systems that's regulating the components of the molecular medium to control the efficiency of the star formation? We have this characteristic average, but then how do we relate that to the um, properties of individual regions within a galaxy? Well, again, observations are driving, uh, the next generation of observations is driving the new resolved empirical relationship. And these are some results that have come out from EDGE, which is this extra galactic database for galaxy evolution. It's a survey of 126 galaxies with the now defunct Karma millimeter array. Whereas the Heracles samples that drove the resolve studies before had really great resolution, they did not sample a lot of the galaxy population. We didn't have quench systems or very many early type systems. Uh, similarly, the things that could actually see this relationship to the specific star formation rate, the cold gas survey, lacked the resolution. What EDGE does is it combines these two samples uh, to uniformly sample the galaxy population, but have the resolution to figure out what's going on within these systems. And so this is the rogues gallery of these 126 systems. Uh, they are at a characteristic distance that's pretty far, 4 point, uh, 6, 65 megaparsecs. Uh, but with an interferometer, you can get that down to kind of characteristic kiloparsec scales within these systems. And we're getting enough surface density that we can actually see the molecular disk in, uh, the, through, 
well resolved outside of the nuclear region. To give you uh, the other big advantage of these uh, observations is they're paired with IFU observations. So we have spatially mapped resolved spectroscopy in the optical, and that gives us a handle on two things that previous generations of studies have lacked. We get everything about the molecular gas, that's kind of this top row for a single galaxy, but the bottom two rows shows us that we actually get the optical emission lines, which are tracing metallicity and star formation rate in the system. And we can also fit a stellar population model to the stellar continuum and get things like the star formation history, the metallicity in the stellar population, the velocity dispersion of the stars, and uh, extinction to the uh, emission lines or to the stellar continuum. So this really gives us a much richer set to pick apart the galaxy parts, uh, galaxy factors that are contributing uh, to the star formation law. So given edge, we just want to check to make sure that all of the previous results are still valid. We find a resolved star formation law. So we find that if we plot the star formation rate versus molecular gas surface densities, we get that nice 1.0 linear relation. We get a constant depletion time of about two gig years. It's good. We see this three-tenths of a dex scatter. This is the residual of the star formation law with respect to the linear fit that I showed you in the previous stage. Uh, here we have this three-tenths of a dex, and it is in excess of the observational errors again. We also, within the population, are consistent with the Santange et al. results, where we see that the depletion time is anti-correlated with the specific star formation rate, and it follows roughly the relationship that we saw previously. Here, the galaxies are whole galaxies color-coded by the metallicities of the systems in 12 plus log O on H units. So everything is there, but we have this mess of parameters. We have almost too many data to really figure out what's going on. And this is where uh, we've sort of taken a tentative step using the, uh, using the tools out of the machine learning uh, community. Now, the machine learning community uh, is going to pick apart this data set and try to figure out what factors are actually important. Kind of statistically blind ask, well, what actually sets the star formation rate in galaxies? And we formulate this as a prediction problem. Uh, this is essentially a linear regression uh, that's predicting star formation rate in terms of everything else in the extragalactic database on galaxy evolution, everything else that we know from observations. And this is great because you, know, you can fit a plane and call it machine learning, and that's good uh, for you know, sounding awesome, but really it's not that complicated. All we're doing is we're fitting a plane to the data. Um, so we predict the star formation rate in terms of everything else, linear coefficient times every other contribution uh, in the database. But what makes it sassy and machine learning like is that we take our goodness of fit term and we have sort of how well does the model predict the data term. And then we have this extra regularization term. And that regularization term is just a fancy way of we're messing with chi-squared so that we get the results we want. But the, result, uh, the regularization term, what it does is it's formulated here to make it so that a parameter has to fight against uh, the regularization to be significant. Lasso is good at the principle of variable selection. It throws out factors that don't contribute to the fit. And and therefore, it tells you, if you ask what's important at predicting the star formation rate, this lasso uh, method will go ahead and tell it to you. So it fits a hyperplane to the data. And there, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Well, not really. Um, the problem with hyperplanes is that they fill the entire parameter space that you're looking at. So all I'm showing you here is the surface density of star formation as a function of molecular gas surface density. And this is just the slice of the hyperplane through the parameter space that is sufficiently close to the points to kind of be represented. This is sort of the inner quartile range of uh, where the uh, hyperplane cuts through the data space. And really all you get about it, out of that is like, eh, it's kind of close to the data. 
kind of tilts in the same direction the data goes. Uh, you can also throw in the gas metallicity and pull that out and sort of figure to see that, oh, we, we're spanning the data set there. But a better way to visualize this is these uh, kind of plots. These are partial regression plots. And what we do is we say we take the star formation rate, we subtract off all of the model contributions from everything but the variable we're interested in, and we get as a result a plot of the induced response of star formation as a function of a parameter. And this kind of tightens up that extra spread in the data set so that we can see the regression uh, kind of edge on in the space that we care about. And so we can actually see here that the molecular gas uh, is predicting star formation rate and induces some very vari positive variation in the star formation rate. We'd expect that. More gas, more star formation. But what wasn't obvious before, until we did this, was that you can do a similar exercise for the stellar surface density. And we find that st more stars equals higher star formation rate. And in fact, it is stronger than the molecular gas contribution to the star formation rate. And this would get swept away with single parameter studies because stellar surface density and molecular gas surface density are correlated in galaxies. Higher stellar surface densities happen at the centers of galaxies, where you get high molecular gas surface densities. But what we're doing with this multilinear regression is we rely on cases where we have high stellar surface density and low molecular gas surface density, and vice versa to detangle the independent predictions of the gas versus the stellar surface density. So we can actually see these as separate effects. So both of these were reported and conjectured in the literature. But something that wasn't as obvious is that the age of the stellar population also matters. This is the mass weighted age for uh, the stellar population as a function of the star formation rate, or sorry, that star formation rate as a function of the mass weighted age. And this is the luminosity weighted age. And both of these are anti-correlated with the star formation rates in galaxies. So older stellar populations are, for whatever reason, I get to live in the empirical world here, is those older stellar populations are less efficient at forming stars than younger stellar populations. There's no obvious connection here to the mass weighted age, which is preferentially tracing the old stellar population. And so the key tie into the theoretical world where we sort of see this connecting and being consistent is that this has to do with the dy how dynamically hot these stellar systems are. All stellar systems are preferentially kind of inflated. Their velocity dispersions have their vert like index, their velocity dispersion, the vertical and radial directions are larger uh, than they are in young systems. It forms in a cold disk and then kind of puffs up through dynamical interactions and star-star uh, interactions. And so we think that this is the key factor that's going on. And we're making a prediction that we can ultimately test with uh, picking apart the actual velocity ellipsoids and seeing whether those are significant factors. But I'm a simple observer. I live in a cartoon world. And here's the cartoon. Um, if we think about the stars as shown in here in this kind of red gradient, this is a disk seen edge on. These old stellar populations are going to have larger stellar scale heights for a given stellar surface density. So they're puffed up. And so that basically spreads out the potential. And when you put gas into that potential, the gas is also going to be puffed up. And so you can take the same surface density of gas, which is the observationally tractable quantity, put it into one of these high scale height systems, and it will have a lower volume density. Vice versa, we have young populations have a thinner, uh, they induce a thinner gas disk. So a given surface density of molecular gas is going to have a higher volume density. And therefore, we come back to that 1959 argument that it's the volume density that matters. And we're starting to get some traction with that. This has shown up repeatedly in the observational and theoretical literature. And so we don't think it's really stepping too far out of the domain to make this, make this as a crazy claim. We think that this is the signature that we're seeing. And it's the cleanest observable in the edge database that we can connect to the star formation rates. 
Now, I've just shown you a selection of the parameters, but we have many more, and that's all shown here. These are all the parameters that we probe in the uh, edge database. Plotted against the, uh, and the horizontal axis here is what's called the standardized slope. Um, and what we've done is we've taken the actual fit out of the regression and we normalize it by the range in the x dimension divided by the range in the y dimension. So the range of the parameter that we care about divided by the range in the star formation rate. And what that does is it puts all of the parameters on equal numerical footing. And when that's important because the metallicity is just on a different, met, uh, a different uh, numerical scale than the, star from, than the surface density of gas. And here we can kind of see the factors that enhance star formation. Those are shown on the um, right-hand side of this dashed line. And then everything that suppresses star formation is shown on the left-hand side of the start of the dashed line. And I've sh called out a few of these. Molecular gas and stellar surface density are associated with increased star formation rates. Uh, galaxy mass and mass weighted stellar age are associated with decreasing star formation rates. And then you can look at other parameters like things that are consistent. The Hubble type of the galaxy, so it's morphology is actually related to uh, later type galaxies. So disks, SD kind of galaxies, uh, have larger star formation rates. And systems that host bars tend to have reduced star formation rates. So we can finally pick apart all of these cases and see just purely empirically where these result, where the, what factors are driving star formation in galaxies. The net result of this is that we, can, uh, we, we argue that the data uh, imply a more complicated star formation rate uh, model than just a single gas into star uh, relationship. You have to put a lot of parameters in to the empirical model to really tighten up the results. And here our model comes down to a 0.18 dex scatter, which is compared to the 0.15 dex scatter. Um, I'm not saying that this is the be all and end all of star formation rate models. What the lasso operation has done is it's highlighted the factors that we want to consider in our future detailed studies of star formation rate in galaxies and try to pick apart uh, what, uh, what things need to go in to the galactic environment surveys to figure out how that gas goes ahead and forms stars. So, this kind of sets the stage of where we are, but then we have to think about where we're going. And we want to get back to this question about how gas forms into stars on the scale of individual molecular clouds. Everything I've presented so far, kiloparsec scales. I am marginalizing over a huge chunk of ISM evolution. We are approximating a lot of cloud evolution in this kiloparsec scale beam. And to address what's happening on small scales, we want to use this next generation of surveys, which is called FANGS, which uh, is the physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies. Um, this is a, uh, a follow-on survey to the PAUSE survey, uh, which was a single uh, target at high resolution. This is many targets at high resolution. And with FANGS and PAUSE, we hope to get to a full puppy sometime, but um, we're getting there. All right, so FANGS is a massive effort. This is one of those gargantuan observational uh, juggernauts that's going along. Ava Schinnerer sits uh, at the head of this. She's the PI. She's an excellent scientist. And she has a remarkably good talent at herding cats. And here's the rest of us down here who listen to whatever Ava says. Um, in particular, I'm calling out, we have several uh, FANGS uh, postdocs that are coming onto the job market uh, in the fall term. So if you see these, uh, if you see this work coming out, uh, just remember that everything that I'm presenting has largely rested on the great work of this, uh, uh, of our junior scientists here. So setting the stage here, all the previous work that I presented was kiloparsec scale or worse. Uh, we want to get down, and so at kiloparsec scale, you resolve the disk scale length of galaxies. So that's kind of, you can resolve arm into arm regions, you can see the characteristic scale length of disks, but we want to get down to the scale height 
of the interstellar medium. And that's the number kicking around is about 100 parsecs. And we've targeted a fiducial observational angular resolution of one arc second for our next generation set of observations because you can get many galaxies, the 17 megaparsec cut, uh, one arc second resolution that gives us this 80 parsec scale number. And the reason why we care a lot about one arc second from the observational perspective is ALMA. Interferometers have this kind of sweet spot where they are maximally efficient at observing uh, emission on a characteristic scale. And ALMA is maximally efficient on one arc second scale and when observing the CO2 to 1 line. It's probably, it's the, it is massively efficient at that scale. So we've taken a leap forward because we have this great new observational facility. Um, I'm going to be talking about some ALMA imaging that has come out, which is the CO2 to 1 imaging. But FANGS is actually many other observational efforts all pushing for this one arc second angular resolution. Uh, we're supported really well by ongoing HST observations, which are starting to come down right now of 38 targets. And then we also have optical IFU observations uh, using MUSE on the VLT of 19 more galaxies, and several other sort of archival or ancillary efforts. But I want to talk mostly about the ALMA imaging. And this is, uh, this is uh, a story of obsolescence, because this is a image of a galaxy at five megaparsecs uh, that I wrote about in my PhD thesis. This is one of my main targets. I sweated over this map. And I, uh, so we did CO1 to 0 observations, 4 arc second resolution. It was 22 hours of main array time with BIMA and months of graduate student agony to produce this glorious map. And then we can take this and just see what 10 years will do uh, to show you what ALMA is cranking out. And this is just this beautiful generational improvement in the observational facilities where we take one hour of main array time, gets us one arc second resolution, and really just a much better sampled map uh, that we can really do a lot of imaging with. The promise of ALMA, I remember going to a NRAO town hall early in my postdoc career and hearing, oh, it's going to produce optical quality imaging of nearby galaxies and molecular gas tracers. And it's actually happening now. We're able to produce these high quality maps matching to the optical data. So what we've done with this glorious new facility is go after these star formation rate questions. So here's another view of the star formation main sequence in galaxies. This is specific star formation rate versus stellar mass in these systems. Uh, and again, we see the quenched and the star forming main sequence. And we've gone ahead and we've observed, uh, or are observing, using ALMA, 74 targets spanning this entire star forming main sequence. So that's the points that you see here. This is not a uniform sampling. We are not trying to reproduce the star forming main sequence uh, statistically. We're trying to sample it because we only have 74 targets and we want to kind of span all of the relevant physics. These are targets that are nearby, so 17 megaparsecs that I mentioned. They're close to face on, and they're bright in the infrared, um, which puts them up here in the star forming main sequence. And these are, to uh, we're getting fully sampled maps. So this is all of ALMA, including total power data, and all of the spatial scale considerations are, uh, or spatial resolution uh, considerations are kind of put to rest by getting this complete sampling. Um, Here's our uh, rogue gallery of 74 targets that we're observing. Uh, it's a three color image where we have the old stars in green, the uh, ISM slash young star, or the ISM is in a red tracer, and then blue shows you the young stars. And the only thing that you really should see looking at this is, ooh, lots of colors. That just means that we have lots of different galaxy and galaxy environments running around here. Um, We've observed the star forming disk, decide, uh, which is basically where there's a lot of interstellar medium. Uh, these are our fields of view. Uh, this is the low resolution component of the ALMA array. We turns out that it was not, not unreasonable to look for CO emission where the interstellar medium was. Um, 
But this, uh, this misses how pretty the data are when you look at them all at once. Um, this is an optical image of the galaxy from ESO. And here is an ALMA image of the same galaxy over here. We can take a closer look at it. And the targets here are being resolved into individual molecular cloud complexes. Uh, we're reaching this mass sensitivity of about Orion molecular cloud scale, for those of you that that's a sensible mass scale. Um, we have a velocity resolution of about two and a half kilometers per second. And what's cool about that is that these data products are not just these flat images. These are position, position, velocity data sets uh, over the entire galaxy. And you can resolve the velocity structure and shifts in the molecular medium here. So you can see in the center, we see the extended circumnuclear disk of the gas. We see uh, at the bar ends in the system enhanced velocity dispersions. You can see these individual molecular clouds popping out of the emission. And we're doing this on a kind of galaxy by galaxy uh, basis. We get these really beautiful maps coming out. So, I'm very excited about this because you saw my thesis data, right? And so nothing, nothing compares to be like, wow, that's, that's a lot better. I'm now obsolete. Um, I'm going to present you a quick summary of a couple results that have come out of a pilot project, Two Fangs. Uh, these are 10 tar or the, the, we've combined and built up a sample of 10 targets uh, from literature and ALMA data, and we've gotten out some interesting kind of quick results here. Uh, the first is we've looked at the probability density function of the molecular medium uh, as we look through these galaxies. These PDFs uh, illustrate uh, basically where the molecular medium sits in different galaxies, under what conditions. So this is a plot of the PDFs of the surface densities of the molecular gas uh, for four separate targets. We have a total, I think, of 15, 15 uh, in the sample once we throw in all of the literature data. And what you should see here is these are different. These PDFs sit at different locations. And so we're seeing this variation uh, in where the ISM sits Sometimes these nuclear regions sit at high surface densities compared to the rest of the disk of the galaxy. And uh, what kind of came out that was interesting is we can look at the uh, correlation of the line width probability density function as a function of the surface density of these PDFs. And in our main sample, this kind of blue cloud here, they all kind of fill in a single location, uh, a single sort of cloud in the sense that higher surface density gas is associated with higher velocity dispersion gas. Um, this is a very observationally grounded measurement. Um, but if you say, well, I can resolve this stuff into 100 parsec scale observations across all these galaxies, and then make the assumption that my my resolution element is comparable to my line of sight depth through the disk, which is something that you get out of these high resolution observations. We see this transition of the molecular medium. Uh, we're moving from the case where it's a 2D structure at kiloparsec scales to a 3D structure, and we sort of see the vertical scales are comparable to, or our, our line of sight scales should be comparable to our resolution scales. And if you make those assumptions, the line of sight depth is comparable to the resolution in the system, you can start to draw the locuses of equipartition, where the gravitational binding energy of this uh, gas is comparable to the kinetic energy of the gas. And that's this top dash dot line running through here. And it's what goes right through the, lo uh, the cloud of points here. We see the antennae, which is this classic uh, merger system. Uh, it sits up here and maybe a little closer to being self-gravitating, which is below this line. And then we see stuff in the local group, uh, which is, again, not our main sample, sits above this line, tends to be kinetic energy dominated rather than um, 
uh, gravitationally dominant. And so we see this sort of constant equipartition of energies at a variety of different internal pressures. And so these dotted lines here show you the, locus, the loci of different pressures in the system. So vast array of ISM conditions, but the molecular medium is always roughly in, in energy equipartition no matter where you look. The final thing that we see is we can actually, with our resolved scales, um, assume this line of sight depth and calculate a free fall time, which is the actual measurement of star formation efficiency. So we go ahead and we say, all right, if we write down a star formation, uh, free fall time in terms of a volume density and assume the volume density is the surface density that we observe in one of these individual beam scale elements divided by 100 parsecs, which is about our linear resolution, then we can figure out the free fall time and measure that distribution over a large chunk of the galaxy. And then we compare that to the depletion time that's measured on large scales. And that's observationally limiting. We don't have star formation rates on these small scales yet. We're working on those observations now. But what we had in the literature was this kind of kiloparsec scale measurements of the gas depletion time. And then we can finally write down our current estimate of what the efficiency per free fall time is for molecular gas in these galaxies. And that uh, shows up here as this distribution. Um, so these are a variety of different assumptions that we can throw in here. And we find that there is this sort of distribution of uh, efficiencies per free fall time that's about 0.5% uh, with some substantial spread. And that compares to other observational efforts at this. But we have this beautiful census across many different galaxies. And it's all this single uh, distribution function. But we can also start to regress that against galaxy properties. And you can sort of see where the narrative is going here. Where we start to measure this efficiency per free fall time as a function of, say, galaxy host mass. And we see that the red points here show our sort of basic observations. And you see that these low uh, stellar mass systems have very high star formation efficiency. And then it drops off. But there's a wrinkle, as there always is. Um, the CO is a tracer of the molecular medium. And if you correct that for the uh, fact that these low metallicity systems are the low stellar mass systems, we can correct that down. And our beautiful relation gets a lot weaker. And so those are the gray points that are shown here. It's still a significant correlation. And it acts in the direction that you might think it would, where these early type systems are sort of locally more efficient at forming stars than the high mass systems. And then there's M31, which is a weird case. It's not part of our main sample. This is sort of out there in the atomic part of the disk, way out of the same regions where the rest of these observations are made. But nonetheless, it sits up there at relatively high efficiency. And we're still trying to reconcile why we would have this uh, high efficiency at very high stellar mass uh, in the system here. So, we're pursuing all of this at higher and higher resolution over a broader and broader sample. Um, and I hope you'll stay tuned over the next year when some of these key results are kind of coming out. Uh, but we're putting out what's the best ever maps of nearby galaxies in CO2 to 1 observation. We find the gas is mostly in energy equipartition. And we see a star formation efficiency per free fall time of half a percent, kind of uniformly across our sample. Um, so, as you go home, remember that the average region of star formation uh, in a galaxy to first order is forming stars at a constant rate, depending on its molecular gas uh, surface content. But to second order, the stellar environment is setting the efficiency of that star formation rate. Uh, we see specifically that these older stellar populations are less efficient at forming stars in a couple of different directions. And uh, we're going to hopefully get to the bottom of this empirically uh, with some ongoing high resolution observations. And I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. All right, does anybody have any questions for her? Hi, Peter. Hi. Uh, nice, nice talk. 
Thank you. The, you mentioned really early on uh, this idea about the material coming into a, an arm and then it starts later. Yep. With this new data, it must be beautiful to study that. Yep. We, uh, that is one of the like 38 papers that we've bullet pointed out here. We have just started writing down the environmental masks where we can do these exact observations. With Hubble, we'll actually have the cluster mass functions as they come out of these galaxies. Right now, the, the observational literature is kind of inconclusive about how legitimate that is. And that's largely suffered from small sample size, but like, we, we haven't learned it yet, but it's definitely on our critical path. So yeah, I think it's, it's one of the most exciting things about this. Hi. Question one, I'll wait for question two. But question one, um, so you have a correlation between anti-correlation between stellar age and specific star formation, or no? Um, Just star formation, right? Yeah. So how do you know that the causation goes between the stars and the Well, yeah. That explains this one reasonably well, which is the young stars. Like these are, these are tilted towards the things that forms at redshift two. Like that's what's dominating this stuff here. So I think that it's just the, the difference in time scales for this relationship is why I'm fingering um, that this is a dynamical effect as opposed to this being the other way around where you would expect star formation. Like, yeah, more, more star formation equals younger stars, right? But I think that's what's manifesting over here and maybe even flattening this relationship. Or, yeah. So, yeah, go for it. Uh, so, question number two was, um, I'm sorry, I lost it. I think I was, um, so, this two giga year time scales rather less than the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. That's classic observational astrophysics, right? Where you just have a lot of objects, but you only get them for one instant in time. So the, uh, we, like, we tend to uh, mentally frame that two gig years as a snapshot for how quickly the gas is turning into stars. So that is often referred to poorly as the star formation efficiency, right? The depletion time is one flavor of the star formation efficiency. We've since realized that efficiency should be non-dimensional and you know, come around to a reasonable way of thinking. Uh, but we sort of view that two gig years as the interesting number to compare to the free fall time to figure out what the actual efficiency is. Uh, so I don't think that like the two gig years ago is super uh, uh, nearly as relevant. I think that 10 gig years ago is where most of these galaxies assembled all of their mass at the redshift two star formation peak. Like these are relatively large systems. Um, and what we're seeing here are the systems that formed their stars at, two, at, at redshift two versus those that formed them at redshift 1.5 versus those that formed them at redshift one, which I guess is there. So yeah, that's, that's what I think we're actually seeing in our observations uh, or in this uh, plot here. The two gig years is just, well, more a factor of the free fall time divided by this half a percent of the efficiency. So that was it. So uh, which is the stronger prediction of star formation rate? Is it the two gig year depletion time or is it the half a percent efficiency? Because there must be quite different predictions when you have the strong variation of all this. Yeah, so I don't actually have a firm observational answer to that. That's something that we're going to pull out by kind of marrying the 
machine learning stuff that I showed you at the beginning with these new FANGS data in. And that's, a, you know, that's future work, but we'll be able to actually address that rigorously. I can't sit here and be like, it is clearly the efficiency. But I've hung out with theorists long enough to know that the star formation efficiency per freefall time is a very well motivated physical uh, description of how the star formation uh, operates. It's, free fall time is a very natural time scale for star formation and therefore writing this down in terms of normalized by the free fall time is a sensible thing to do. So I think that that's more uh, relevant. Observationally, we haven't quite got the traction on it. Certainly, we're going to phrase all our observational papers in terms of efficiency per free fall time as long as we can. Okay. Well, thank you for a very nice